All righty then. Hello. <laughs> this is Game Changers with me, Vicki Abelson, and my guest tonight is Mark Schiff. Take two, we're trying this again because this keeps happening. Hi, Mark. Hello, Vicki. Good to see you again. Good to see, <laughs> good to see everything. Good to see your shoulders. It's, it's, it's been a while, like, you know, 30 seconds since we tried this before. Okay, we, we are actually All live. Alrighty then. Oh, Hello. then, okay. And so now, this is game now changers. we're getting an echo because, okay, but this time we really are. And nobody's joined us yet, so they weren't annoyed by that little sound. Um, we'll be we'll be joined any moment. I'm making sure that yes, okay, we're we're now joined. Joined. So you can't you can't see the people uh, on this thread, but I can. And so if people, a friend of yours, uh, Tova Abadi. Oops. Yes. You know Tova? I do. So Tova is in the hood. Huh? You live in the like the hood, the uh, the shtetl. Do you live over there too? Pico Robertson, I do. I live here with the Jewish people. Okay, so we have to talk about that, Mark, because I, I know of you. I didn't know you, but I know of you for probably 35 years or so. And um, yeah, Gabe was my comedy teacher in 1985. So, so it's been a while. And um, I know you guys came up around the same time, right? Yeah, yeah, New York. New York, Lucian holds. All righty then. I love comic uh, strip 78, 79, 80. I moved to LA in 84. Oh, so you, okay. So you were already gone when I, uh, when I started. So, but you were not, you were not an observe, you were not observant Jewish back in those days, were you? I was not. So my first three years, my parents sent me to an Orthodox, uh, very black hat, religious, Eastern European, yeshiva, they were reformed Jews, but they needed a place that was like a prison that would keep me <laughs> at night. Were you a wild kid, Mark? No, it wasn't that, but there was no daycare when I was growing up. So, you, you know, oh. people let you out at like two and three in the afternoon, yeshiva let you out at like six. Right. So uh, they sent me there because uh, they would keep me till, uh, you know, six o'clock till my parents came home from work. Oh. And, and what was your, what was your, what, they were reformed, but they, were they, here's Hove is on actually. Uh, were they, were they observe, were they observant reformed or? No, no, they, uh, not really. No, you know, we just, uh, maybe once a year we went to uh, temple. And so when did this, so did, were you influenced going to yeshiva? Very much so. I mean, at home we had, we never had pork chops. We would have ham. <laughs> We drew the line with the pork, with the, the, the with the chop, but the ham and the bacon it was like removed enough for us to uh, indulge. Okay, it, and, it, was, and, it was very good too. It was delicious. And so, how long have you been? Um, how long have you been observant? So I, I found my way back. I've always been interested in. In I tried a lot of different things. Let's put it like that. I tried chanting Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. I, I I joined a church for a while when I was. Wait, whoa, wait, what, wait, what? What church did you join? Called the Church in the Gardens. We lived in Forest Hills, and I used to go on these retreats with these uh, the Christian fellowships. This is before I got back to the Jews. This is before you got back. Now wait a second. What? Um, when? Um, when did you live in for? I li I lived in Forest Hills. I went to Newtown. Where, but you did you go to Forest Hills High? I did for a while. Okay, so we were neighbors. Um, and I, I lived off of Queens Boulevard on 68th Road. I, I worked at that McDonald's when I was in high school by Alexander's. Remember that? that um, I do. 63rd, 63rd Drive. There um, you go. I used to steal Beatle records out of there. Do you, okay, do you remember the record store? I, I talked about this last week with Wadi Wachtel because he grew up in Forest Hills also. Do you remember the, the record store on 108th Street? That I certainly do. Revolution, there was, there was, yeah, I do. I used That's to steal from them, I used to steal records from them too. Well, we're gonna talk about how, how you've had this change of life where you, yeah, I, 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 I ripped off a few things in my day. I don't think I ever ripped off a record. How do you rip off a record? What would you do with it? You wear a trench coat. Oh you're a flasher you wear a trench coat and you come in or well, there's two ways one yeah. is you come in, in with a record album a couple record albums and you take an album and you slip it in the middle of the ones you came in with yeah so that way yeah 
slip it under your coat. That was before they had to, uh, you know, when you were walking out the door. Right. I was free. Uh. <laughs> yes. Those were the good old days, weren't they? The good old days before they, they, they put that tag on there that they needed. Uh, you ever get one of you ever uh, get Did you ever take one of those home? Yes. <laughs> yes. There's nothing worse than that. What do you especially, do? Especially if you stole it and you got to go back and ask them to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Those things were the worst. So, all right. So, so, uh, all right. So you're, you're, you're going to yeshiva, but I'm assuming that you didn't get observant back then. No. Well, what happened was I went and I fell in love with the rabbis. I always, I always liked the rabbis. I like, I like fanatics. <laughs> I'm a big fan of fanaticism. <laughs> and people, people that go really far out with, with their concepts, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why I didn't like reform or conservative. <laughs> middle of the road, wish. <laughs> I'm joking. I like, you know, people that think they're going to, you know, God's going to give them a heart attack any second. You know what I mean? They're, so um, I went the first three years. Yeah. Um, very strict school. The rabbis would beat us sometimes, you know, like the nuns in the Catholic school had nothing on these guys. Okay, wait, no, now I want to talk about this because my father was a yeshiva teacher. Wait, yes. which yeshiva did you go to? Well, I went to two in the Bronx. I went to something called Yeshiva Zichra Moshe and Yeshiva Torah via Muna. Now you lived in Queens and you went to Yeshiva in the Bronx. No, no, I went, no, I went, I lived in the Bronx when I was a little kid. So did I. Where did you live in the Bronx? Right off the Grand Concourse on Creston and Burnside. I lived on the Grand Concourse right off 161st Street. Right oh. near Alexander's, not far yeah. from. I used to steal from that Alexander's. <laughs> I started at that one and they, cause, and they had cheap stuff there. But when I got to Forest Hills, they had a much better variety of stuff. <laughs> this is his stuff. Okay, so you went, so, oh, so you did Yeshiva when you were a little kid. First, second, and third grade. And I never forgot it to this day. Wow. And it was because of the teachers. The teachers, the, the depth of it, it, it seemed important to me. You know, American uh, secular school never seemed important to me. I learned to read and write and do, I learned math at the racetrack. I, <laughs> I, used, to cut, I used to cut school and uh, go to the aqueduct in Belmont. Oh my God. And I learned fractions and division <laughs> And, and track variants and depths of track and you know, <laughs> lengths and mutters and. Well, all right, so so you're a little kid, you yes. go to yeshiva, you're coming home, you're maybe going to temple once a year. It, all right, wait, now did it, my father was a yeshiva teacher and we, we were observant at home when I lived with, when we were little, I was little. But but we used to cheat because he would drive on the sh on on the Sabbath, and we would also go out to eat treif. We would go out and we would eat Chinese food on Sunday night because that was sacrosanct, right? That's what Jews do. Right. So, so did you feel guilty when you would go home and live differently than the other kids in the issue? I, I was I, I was too young and hmm. I don't remember really um, hanging out with any other families, religious families when I was a kid. My parents didn't really, they just sent me to school. It was like a place to lock me up till six o'clock. <laughs> it would, there was no relationship with anything there. So what, what, did your, what did your father do for a living? What did your parents do that you were so, they were busy? Well, my father worked in, uh, in the trucking, he drove a truck and worked on a platform in Manhattan in the garment district. Uh-huh. Um, he actually met my mother. He on the weekends he would uh, teach in an auto school, an auto driving school, and my mother came in for lessons. Oh wow! And uh, he taught her how to drive, and then married her. That's a nice thing. Uh, and okay, and uh, so do you have siblings? Zero. Zero. Okay, who was funny in your house besides you? Well, it was just my mother and father. You know, my father was. Uh, so my father was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, he'd make a lot of faces, fart sounds under his arm. You know, the, the, you know, you know oh, yeah. He would do that sort of thing. And uh, my mother had a pretty good sense of humor, but it, it was a tough upbringing, you know. Was, they were American from the Bronx. I was just going to ask where they were from. They were, they were born here? Yeah. My grandparents on my mother's side came from uh, Europe, Russia. Okay. And, and uh, um, 
Your father's people? Also the Bronx and then the generation before Hungary. Okay, so were they brought up with? Those sides were kosher, they were not religious. Although my grandfather on my mother's side was what they call a shamus. Mm -hmm. He used to sit with the dead bodies at night. Like when somebody died, wow. in Jewish religion, somebody has to sit with the body that night before they bury it the next day. Right. And um, he also drove a hearse. Wow. He got pulled over once for speeding with a dead body in the car. <laughs> Uh, he was late for a funeral, he was lost <laughs> from the rest of the pack. And the cop asked him what was his hurry with a dead body in the car, you know. Oh my God. Yeah, so was, so you weren't the first lawbreaker in the bunch? Not really. Not really. Yeah. Uh, my parents were honest people though. My, they, my, my father and my mother in those days would play the numbers, you know, with the, with the mob. Oh, yes. you know? They'd gamble on the numbers and stuff like that. And, Every once in a while, they would borrow money from the wrong people because they were poor. Didn't have any money, really. I was brought up very lower middle class. Yeah, I don't really understand. You know, the rent when I was growing up was like uh, $60 a month. How, how do you not have, how do you be that broke when two people were working and you rent $60 a month? It's, because I, if you're, they probably were making less than that a week each, right? And they're making very little. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did your mother do? She worked in real estate. She rented apartments in New York. Well, that should have been the big bucks, no? Well, it wasn't in Manhattan. She did it in, in well, actually in Queens and in the Bronx. So they were, no, not really. It was a job, you know, it was like a, a glorified secretary, you know, people would so call. She them. wasn't getting the commission on the-, on the Zero commission. No. You would call up and go, I hear you have an apartment. She'd go, yes, would you like to see it? They say they want it. You sign the lease, goodbye. And the owner of the building gets all the money. I see. I see. Uh, she'd make a fortune today. That's yeah. today. You know, I had an apartment uh, when, I, when I knew Gay back in New York on 76th and 2nd. <clears throat> I had a studio, $150 a month. And uh, this would never happen now. But um, this realtor sent me to see the apartment. And when I got there, there was this little old Jewish man. And he, he had a lease in his hand. And he was handing it to this kid with red hair. Yeah. And he looks at me, he goes, uh, why are you here? So I said, I'm here to see the apartment. He goes, are you a Jewish boy? So I said, yes. And he pulls the lease out of the kid's hand. Yeah. And he goes, if you want it, it's yours. <laughs> because the other kid wasn't uh, one of the uh, tribe. Uh, but luckily, uh, luckily yeah. the kid didn't want it anyway. So I got the apartment which was a nice thing. Cindy Beagle says, your family sounds like the Jewish monsters. Uh, Cindy, Cindy wrote on all the Gary Marshall shows. She's a comedy writer. So she's going to be nothing but trouble, this whole thing. Gary so, Marshall was very nice to me. Oh, OK. Did you work with Penny? No, Gary, I said. Oh, Ga oh Gary. Did you work for Gary? Did you say Penny or Gary? I thought you said Penny, but I love Gary was in my living room. I love Gary so much. He was a sweet Gary. guy. I wrote a play called The Comic. That yes. Larry Miller was starred in, and um, Love Larry. it was a great play, and um, Gary Marshall wanted to produce it as his theater in the, in, in the Valley, the Colony Theater, I think uh -huh. it was. Well, he had his own, uh, what was it called? It's now called the Gary Marshall Theater. I can't remember what it was I called. I think before, before. that, it might have been the Colony. I don't know, but anyway, uh -huh. we did a couple of times. It just didn't work out, but he could not have been a nicer guy. A lovely, lovely man. Um, so wait, where were we? We were um, before I was so rudely interrupted by reading comments. Um, so all right, so you're 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 in the Bronx, you're in Queens, you're going to Yeshiva, then you start going to regular school. Do you feel weird? Is it weird for you to then go to? Well, no, that's I just kind of eased into it. But I, I I was finished with school around fourth grade. I was done. It, it was over. I I, I showed up. I learned to read, I learned to write, I learned my math, uh, but I didn't do any work for, from like fifth grade on. Did you graduate? No. I, well, I, yeah, everybody gets out of fifth and sixth grade unless you- no. no, I mean, did you graduate high school? No, I got a high school equivalency diploma. I got, I got left back in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Oh, stop. No, absolutely. What were you doing? What were you so busy doing? Cutting school. Wow. You don't look, you don't look the, the Falcon Theater. Thank you, Jeff. That's it. Yes. School, smoking weed. You know, I was already uh, on my way uh, gone. 
So, um, my so when, when do you start getting high? Because I started 13. When, when do you start getting high and drinking and doing all that? Seventh thing? grade. Seventh grade. Is that when, that's when you started getting left back? I'm making the Yeah, my parents would come in every year after I got left back and begged them to put me ahead. And they said, well, at the beginning of next term, if he gets an A in everything, we'll move him ahead. So I got an A in everything and they moved me ahead. Then wow. They, then they leave me back again. My parents came in and begged them and they moved me ahead. So it was like, leave him back, beg, leave him back, beg. And then, <laughs> and I went to high, then I went to Forest Hills High School, but I didn't really go. I was finished. Okay. And obviously it didn't cost you too much. I mean, wow, that's pretty amazing. When, when do you know you're funny? When does that well, Let me put it like this. You see, I self-educated myself as best I could. When I, when I didn't go to school, mm -hmm. I didn't really just sit home and do nothing. Okay. I, what would, were you doing? I would read books. And I would go into Manhattan, I would go see plays. I would go to Lincoln Center. They used to have record players and I would listen to like long, like uh, Eugene O'Neill plays and Ibsen plays on record. I would go see the ballet and operas. Well, how, how, where were you getting the money for this? You know, I had, uh, I had, I, I, it was nothing. It didn't cost much. They had student this for you know, right. for like a buck or two. I mean, the library was free. But, uh, you know, you can get in for $2 to see uh, the Joffrey Ballet on a Wednesday afternoon. No kidding. Yeah. So I would do all those things. Did you have a job? Did you, uh, like I worked at McDonald's and stuff. Did you have a job when you were in school? Well, I wasn't in school, but. Uh, uh, when you weren't going to school, did you have a job like high school years? I, I, I was, uh, I had my own marijuana store. <laughs> I, I, was way, I was way ahead of the curve. You know, yeah. now they got all these signs out, but uh, I have my own little business going. Okay. It wasn't a serious business. It was just to keep me loaded, you know, just to keep right. me uh, But I did work, um, like, for instance, I'd work a couple of days a year, oh. make some, some money that would hold me over. <laughs> all right. So, so... You're a little I had jobs. Let me just answer. Yeah. I had some real jobs, but I hated them and they, they, I would literally start crying. Okay, so like what did you do? What what did you do? Like I was a crew chief at McDonald's. I had horrible jobs. What, what did I you worked do? at EJ Corvettes? You oh, remember? I remember Cor sure. Do you know what that stood for? Than Alexander's. You know what EJ Corvettes EJ stood for? What? EJ Corvettes, 11 Jewish Korean veterans. Absolutely <laughs> true. Oh no, come on. EJ, 11 Jewish Corvettes, Korean vets. Really? Yeah. So I worked in the little boys department and I got $2, 15 cents an hour. So at the end of 40 hours, I got like $80. They took off taxes. Then they made me join the union. Then I had to pay to get into Manhattan and buy lunch every day. So I came home with about $20. Right. Started weeping, crying. <laughs> I would look at the check and I just started bawling. And I said, I, I quit. And so, now, all right. So you're not making money as a comic. All right. But, all right. Along with this, this working thing, when, when do you realize you're funny? When you're in yeshiva and you're a little kid, do you know you're funny? Yeah. Well, okay. So I have a photo of me at 12 years old, uh, emceeing a show. <laughs> now, actually, younger than that, I was not wrong. So let me step back. I was seven and uh, it was in yeshiva. And um, the rabbi had me host this little thing. When I really knew I was funny, okay, so 12 years old, my parents took me to see a show and Rodney Dangerfield was performing at a place called the Boulevard Nightclub off of Queens Boulevard, right near Alexander's, right past Alexander's. Yeah, okay, yeah. There's, there's a mafia nightclub called the Boulevard Nightclub. <laughs> and uh, Al Martino was the headliner. Oh my God. He, he had a famous song, I want some red roses for a blue, blue lady. Yeah. yeah. So Rodney opens the show when I was 12 in this wow. night. And I got a photo of it. Okay. I have it on. That is crazy. So um, I have it behind me on the wall. I can show it to you. Yeah, yeah. Let me get oh, it. Show us, show us. <laughs> I'm going to read the comments. Cindy Beagle says, oh, I'm so surprised he had a pot shop. Mason Reese is on. Do you know Mason from New York? Yeah. So can you see? Okay. There's a little glare, but. Uh, so. Wow. So it's my mother and father and me at the nightclub. 
How did you get into the nightclub when you were a little kid? Little well, you, you're with your parents. They would like, you know, I would sit there and have a Shirley Temple and, uh, you know, yeah. whatever it is. So Rodney came out and I said, that's it. I knew what I wanted. And my parents were laughing so hard and I never saw them laugh that hard. I said, oh. I'm going to do this for a living. I mean, look, look, look at what this guy is doing to these people. Wow. And, um, I never looked back. Never looked back. And then at 18... Okay, wait, before you get to 18, so are you listening to comedy albums? Are you watching yes. comedy shows? Who were your heroes when you were a little kid? Shelley Berman. Um, I listened to Lenny Bruce. I listened to, um, who else there? Um, Alan Sherman. Remember Alan Sherman? Oh, God, yeah. God, I still listen to him. I still listen to him. Did you watch like the Smothers Brothers and like- No, all I, didn't, no I didn't watch that stuff. Okay. Um, I watched some, the Tonight Show was on too late for me when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. We see Ed it. Sullivan, of course. Watched Ed Sullivan, loved Alan King. and, and London Lee, remember London Lee? I, I got a chance to meet him. I got a chance to meet everybody. Oh, that's so nice. London Lee, all these guys. I made it, I went on a, like a, a sojourn to meet all these people. And you know, my father was an MC in the Catskills. He was a yeshiva teacher during the year and an MC in the Catskills in the summertime. So you, I went you to, were my father. I went to camp in the Catskills. I went to a church camp called Camp Tagola in Monticello. Okay, I spent all my summers up there, every summer of my life up there. I'll tell you an experience I had. That's when I started my little drinking thing. Ah. At camp. Yeah. First night of camp, um, I sit, kid in my bunk, everybody's asleep. I said to the kid, you know, I know a place where you can get some beer down the road. And he <laughs> goes, what? He's like a little Jewish kid, you know? So I said, I know, yeah, yeah, let's go. He goes, beer? I said, yeah, come on, let's go. Let's sneak out. We're... And he came with me. Yeah. And they used to have these guys called the Bimmies. And, and they were like the dishwashers and stuff. And right, they, right, right. And they would, and you give them like a buck and they buy you some beer. So they buy some beer and he gets loaded, really loaded. And I got to carry him back and I'm okay. And they kick him out of camp. They catch him the first night and send him home. And he rat you out. We have nothing happened to me. Wow. So anyway, cut to 20, like 25 years later, I call my friend Tom on the phone. I, I'm talking to my friend Tom and he, he says, hold on a second. And he says to somebody sitting in the apartment with him, he goes, my friend Mark Schiff's on the phone. Just give me a minute. And, and I hear the voice go, Mark Schiff, <laughs> Mark Schiff. <laughs> and I, can I talk to him? And he, he goes, is this the same Mark Schiff? <laughs> you know, to go to camp. I said, yes. He goes, you, it was the worst summer of my life. My parents <laughs> to me every day for the entire two months because of you. And I, I did my best to apologize to him. I, mean, I made amends to him, but I ruined his summer for two months. His parents, I mean, just were told, yeah. <laughs> amazing that he didn't rat you out and you didn't go home with him that's pretty crazy sometimes uh, you know you get away with so, so anyway um i knew i you know people always told me what they said was when i was a kid they, they would say you know stop being so funny <laughs> you're always trying to be funny that's what they would say why, why are you always trying to be funny everything is funny <laughs> or they would say to me you're the most annoying person i've ever met I've never met anybody as annoying. You, why do you, why, you, how do you, why are you so annoying? <laughs> so the combination, um, I was able to work into a, a profession. <laughs> Which is very good. Okay, so, so you don't get through high school, but you kind of get through high school. You are, when, when, are you, when are you starting to fashion the funny into stand-up? Okay, does... so I know it's what I want to do. Okay. So I move out of my house when I'm 17. And I move into Manhattan okay. with my friend, John Bennett. And we get a loft down in Soho. Nobody's living in Soho at the time. Wow. The empty joint. There's like just a couple of handful of artists that got lofts down there. Right. So we rented 2,500 square feet on Worcester and Prince right off of Houston Street, a beautiful place. Wow. 2,500 square feet. And... Uh, He's not, he's not Jewish, so he's very handy at building things. <laughs> you know, I'm more of a foreman type, you know, going a little over to the left, a little over to the right. So he built three bedrooms. 
this place. <laughs> and the rent was $350 a month. Yeah. And we got a third roommate and we charged him 300. <laughs> that was your doing, I bet. <laughs> That's right. So my rent was $25 a month in Manhattan in a 2,500 square foot walk. Oh my God. And that put me through comedy school. That guy paid my rent for five years. He lived with us. Okay, what did comedy school mean? What, is, what did that mean for So you? I could go to the clubs every single night and perform. I didn't go right away. I went, I performed a few times, but I had such, um, such stage fright. Okay, wait, let's go back a minute. Did you do plays in school? Did you do that kind of thing? I didn't go to school, but yeah. <laughs> I go did to um, go to um, HB Studio in Manhattan at yes. 100 Bank Street. Yes, I went. I studied there with a lady named Alice Spivak. Nice. Berghoff. And Uta Hagen was teaching there at the time. Wow. And she was in uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway. Mm -hmm. she, was, she, she made that, uh, that role famous. And it wasn't Lisa Taylor. She was also in The Other. Do you, did you ever see The Other? It was yes, I did. She was, and I read her book, Respect for Acting. Mm -hmm. Excellent book. So I studied at HB. I took um, improv. I took um, acting classes. Mm -hmm. And I also took ballet and dance and jazz dancing at a place called Luigi's on 55th Street. Wow. So um, I kind of believed in the Russian uh, idea that you, you, know, you had to be full body, you had to be movement was just as important as the words. You like, you know. I love that. So I, I you know, I read things like books called The Tour Support Theater, and it was uh, Stanislavski stuff. And I did my best, but I never amounted to a really becoming a really good actor. I, I, I had too much stage fright, too much fear. That's an interesting profession you went into with a lot of fear. How did you, now, how about writing? How, because a, a comedian is a writer. How did you, how did you learn to write? It, it, how did that come to you? Okay, writing, I was never afraid to do. Okay. No fear of writing, no fear of the blank page. Excellent. Never, never um, writer's block. I could sit, I could, I could go sit down and write five pages right now. Fantastic. Not an issue. I started writing when I was about 12 on my own. I mm -hmm. just out of nowhere. I picked up a pen and started writing plays. Wow. How did yeah. you know structure and form and stuff? I didn't know anything. I, 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 you know, everything I learned, I learned on my own or by either reading or going to see and now I'm still studying. I take the master classes. You know, yes. master class, right? So who have you, yes, who have you done a master's class with? So I, I you know, I've done Aaron Sorkin. I've done David Sudeikis. I've, I've done uh, um, Joyce Carol Oates. Nice. And I hope, you know, like half a dozen of them or more. So I study with them now. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I've never done one of those online. Uh, do you, does it, does it work? It must work. You've been doing... You know, it works like everything else. It works if you work it. There you go. You know, and it comes with a, uh, you can print out a book and you go along with the uh, the teachers. The teachers are some of the best in the world. I mean- Do you get any feedback from them? There are um, community boards that you can type into and people will answer you and um, mm -hmm. and done much of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I just keep writing. I don't talk much about it. That's a good thing. Uh, the secret to writing is writing, so you're already there. Yeah. So, so you so you learn by trial and error. So, I assume you failed at first. I assume you didn't write nonstop for years. No, for years, totally. You know, um, that's how you learn stand up. You know, you just keep, and that's how you get. You know, nobody can teach it to you really. There's some basics, but mm -hmm. you know, you you learn it by doing. Mm -hmm. So. Do you remember any of your like very early jokes, like you're when you're like really start when you're really green and starting? Well, I started out uh, with telling some old jokes at first, just to get up on stage, you know, like that weren't mine. But um, I went through periods like Lucian. It's funny at the comic uh, comic strip. I went through a thing there where I didn't talk on stage. I would just like make faces and sounds. And Lucian uh, said he wasn't gonna put me on anymore unless I started talking. <laughs> My heroes were like uh, the silent screen guys like Buster Keaton and Chaplin 
and people like that. How did it go when you'd get up there and just make faces? I would get pretty good laughs, but uh, I think he was right. Ultimately, he wasn't going to go anywhere. You know? So you, you do your whole five just standing there making faces? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, laughing. You know, uh, I would just bang into a wall or something like that. <laughs> you know. uh, experiment. Yeah. So tell us the people that you came up with that were there in 78 and 79 and stuff with you back in the day. So, um, of course, there was Seinfeld, who was the MC. We saw him. He was there every night. And he was my first road gig ever, really, was with Jerry. Wow. Washington, D.C. We went down in my uh, 76 Toyota Corolla. What year was that? Oh, 76. No, you well, it was a 76 Corolla. So it was about an 80, around okay. 80. Uh -huh. um, 79, maybe. Um, so it was Larry Miller, George Wallace, Gilbert Gottfried. Um, Lynn Boozler was around at the time. Richard Lewis was still around at the time. Andy Kaufman was just graduating from there. Carol Leifer must have been Carol around. Leifer. Was Paul Reiser around then? Paul Reiser was around every night. He left for a while to go work for his parents. Um, Dennis Wolfberg. Dennis Wolfberg was there every night. It was amazing. Uh, some of the happiest days of my life. Extraordinarily oh. alive time. Oh, God. So now when you started at this, okay, how did you pass the strip? Obviously, you started talking. Did you did, yeah. Lu did Lucian pass you right away? No, so I actually talk? passed before the strip actually was built. They auditions. Well, they were Richie and Bob, uh, right. and uh, um, they were they were building it, and the, the main showroom was not finished. There was still dirt on the floor. They hadn't actually cemented it over, so they had open auditions. And I went there one day, and they sat in two little chairs in the dirt, <laughs> and I stood about four feet away. And I did like five minutes to these two guys and they knew nothing about comedy. They were bar owners from the Bronx and uh, they knew nothing. They said, okay, fine. And they passed me. Wow. Now so the improv- Get the Lucian pass, wow. Now the improv was a different thing. I auditioned at the improv 17 weeks in a row before I passed. So they kept they kept flunking me seventeen weeks in a row. Hey, that's resilience that you kept going back every week. That's so. Were you writing new, choice? Were you I, writing I mean, material in between, or were you just doing it better? Both. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, we were scientists. We were. Uh, we would. We would create the little potion of material, and then we would do it, and then we would go back to our wherever we were living and listen to the tape recorder and play it back and forth until we heard what, you know, and fix it all up. And then the next night we would do three, four, five sets if we could. Okay, so now it was the comic strip. It was the improv, was Catch already open back then? Catch was open, but I didn't get on there for years. I was, um, it was it, it was the primo. Yes. Mm -hmm. and there was also a click there that I never got into and never wanted to be part of. Mm -hmm. And um, so it took me long to get on. Yeah. So now are you working? When do you start working at it? When are you making money? Because it's like $5 a set. Oh, and the comedy seller, I guess, came along later. Later. Uh, so are you, how are you making money while you're doing this? Well, I had my roommate that paid the 300 rent. Oh, you, you only needed 25 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> $25. And um, our utility bill, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. Yeah. Um, Condison <laughs> sent us a bill when we first moved in and it, it said $5 and an E next to it. And the E was, and I called them up and they, they said, that's estimate. They put an E. Right. Now, we don't come all the time to check the meter. So anyway, for about three years, we were paying $5 with an E next to it. Then yeah. we get this bill one day for $33,000 and uh, from Con Edison. And they said, uh, the thing was broken and then we have 2,500 square feet and we got this giant gas heater and we got this and the lights. And now they estimate that it would have cost, uh, we owe $33,000 for the <laughs> years. So I told them, I said, listen, I, first of all, I have no money. Yeah. And um, it's not my fault the, the, the thing was broken because I didn't tamper with it. 
And the lady said, hold on. And she went and spoke to somebody. She came back and said, we're going to let it go. Wow. So, that unbelievable. Yeah. Which, by the way, I'm just warning everybody, I got a notice from, from Edison today telling me that they could turn our power, you know, there, the, there are fires in LA, and when it gets windy, they do power shutdowns, and I got a notice today that it could, so at any moment we could, I could be talking to you by, by phone light, we'll see. So, um, the other way I made money was this. Yes. So, in, I lived near Grangeville, right outside of Greenwich Village, on in Soho. So there was a place, they had a lot of coffee houses. Right. And I used to have this giant, you know, the five gallon water bottles that they turn upside down in the, in the offices or whatever. People, yeah, yeah, sure. The giant thing, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I had one of those and I filled it with uh, halfway up with change. <laughs> change and, and bills. Yeah. And, um, I went to a coffee house and I poured some on the table, some, some money, and I put up a sign. And I said, if you need money, take some. If not, please leave money for those that do need. And um, I was making about $20 an hour. <laughs> People would come by and they'd go, really? Can I really take money if I want? I said, help yourself. And they go, and they would just dig in, you know, because I was willing to give to them. And they would uh, throw in a buck or two or a lot of change. And uh, so that paid my, uh, my way for a long time. How'd you make amends for that, Mark? We're going to get to making amends. But how, how do you ever make amends for something like that? Well, I wasn't lying. I said, for those that need. OK. You know, That's true. Yeah. It, was a, it was a bit of a loophole. <laughs> I, I wasn't <laughs> lying. I wasn't actually robbing. I, I I did give them the opportunity to take money if they wanted to. You, you did. You did. Yeah. So oh, was that that was supporting you? That yes. little mover? That my roommate for, that paid the three hundred, my five dollar Con Edison bill, and every once in a while my parents would come in and drop a twenty or forty on me. All right. So so you're doing you're doing the city clubs are, are you getting like those andy scarpati gigs like out of the city Started doing chimbalazzo's andy scarpati you know out in new jersey um yeah we would do all those things and um we'd go out to new jersey and those were i don't know 50 bucks or something like that right 45 50 bucks and uh you rode out with two or three three other comics and the driver Right. And uh, you did it. It was always a blast. We did places called the Ground Round, which would be like a uh, hamburger thing. <laughs> and we did all these places. And uh, it's how you learn your craft. So when you started, uh, Cindy asked, you know, did you have a persona on stage and what kind of what what was your what was your your thing? Uh, yeah. So. Um, not completely, you know, I talked a lot about them, you know, my parents a lot. Mm -hmm. I turned, I was able, you know, I'm one of those people, I'm able to turn the pain to gain, you know, like uh, I was able to make uh, what wasn't funny when I was growing up into very funny. I used real life stuff. So I was very observational like that. I, I did not ever, I, I, I drew the line at doing TV commercials mm -hmm. and I never mentioned any real names in my act. Like, if, or movies or TV shows. If you had to have knowledge of and seen something, it never got in my act because- That's I, interesting. I felt it It would just date itself and- uh, And also alienate part of the audience that didn't maybe- yeah, then, so never did that. And then I also decided to always work clean, even when I didn't have to. But look, Jerry, Larry Miller, Paul Rice, all of us were really pretty much clean. Yes. And um, so, so would it be hard to follow somebody who wasn't? Sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's a mindset. Like if you get a real blue act and listen, I have nothing against it. People can do whatever they want, you know. But sometimes if there's a half hour or 20 minutes of, you know, yeah. a person that guy's head off and all that stuff. And it's, it's. That's the, the the mindset that they're in, right? Um, that's why I never went. I did a Playboy Club uh, like twice, and I never went over there because um, 
I couldn't compete with the girls. <laughs> um, my stuff was just too wholesome, too uh -huh. way. Mm -hmm. That makes you, sense. You know, the giant bazookas. <laughs> so how did how how did things start to shift for you? How did you get your how did you get your first Tonight Show? How did that happen? So. <clears throat> Okay, Jim, there must have been stuff that led to that. You didn't just get a Tonight Show, I assume. Well, no, no. In my case, I, there's a real story to it. Oh, good. There's a real I love story. Stories. Yeah. Let's have it. Yeah. So, Jim McCauley, have mm -hmm. you heard the name? Mm -hmm. So, Jim McCauley, the talent coordinator for the Tonight Show, who picked the comedians for Johnny, mm -hmm. went to the comic strip one night. And uh, he looked at a few of us. Mm -hmm. And I did about, this was, this was, um, 1982, maybe. That's really early. Yeah, okay. So he came in, we did five minutes each. And I blew the roof off the place. I really did great. Wow. I was, uh, and some people were standing and clapping, and it was really something. Oh. So after the, after the set, uh, McCauley's out at the bar, and he's talking to some people. And I, I stayed away, and I saw he talked to a couple of the comics. And then he left. He walked outside the comic strip, and I... I followed him out. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, hey, Jim. He goes, hey, Mark, how you doing? So I said, uh, good. What would you think of the set? He goes, really funny, but uh, being quite honest, it's, it's not Johnny's cup of tea. And, you know, I, I, we, we can't do it. I'm, I, you know, I have to buy what Johnny likes. Uh -huh. I, and I, I, I said, listen, you saw what happened. I killed him in there. I just destroyed him. He goes, right. I, I know, but it's not Johnny's thing. You know, I just can't, it's just not his thing. I know what he likes. And I'm not saying you're not funny, but he, I know what he likes. So he walked, he started, turned around, started walking down 2nd Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I scream, F you. As loud as I can. The entire word. Wow. And he turns around, he points his finger at me and he goes, you will never, ever do the Tonight Show as long as you live. Holy shit. And he turns and he walks off into the night. So seven years later, it took me seven years from there to get on. Wow. I'm around the clubs for years, and he was always very nice to me, but uh, he didn't show much interest. Right. One night I'm in San Francisco, headlining at the Punchline in San Francisco a Club. Mm -hmm. Comes walking in, and he says, uh, hey, Mark, how you doing? I said, hey, good. What are you doing here? He said, I'm, I'm here to see the guy that's uh, opening for you. I hear he's pretty funny. So I said, yeah, great. And he goes, you mind if I stick around and watch you after? So I said, no, that, that's fine with me. And he stuck around. And then I get off the stage. He looks at me, he goes, you got the show. And he says, call me Monday. And then I call him on Monday. He goes, two weeks from uh, Friday, you're on. You just gave me goosebumps because that takes a lot for somebody like that to eat their words. That takes a lot. That, that, that's an absence of ego. That's very mature. It was, and it took a long time, and it, he never, ever brought up wow. to him, and I never brought it back up to him. Wow, that's really uh, not, wait, and, and you're, you're an active alcoholic at this time, aren't you? No, I already stopped. Oh, you're already sober now. 1988, when he saw me and gave me the show, I had stopped. And when did you get sober? I got sober in 84. Okay, so you're a changed man. Maybe he sees that change in you too. Yeah, when he saw me in 82, mm -hmm. my cups. Yeah. I was doing my thing and there was a lot of anger brewing inside of me that got misdirected to say the least. And um, I took it out on him. You know, he had to be a smart and intuitive man to have that job. And I'm betting that he could see the difference in who you were in 82 and who you were. Well, let, let me tell you, first of all, he was 1000% right. I was not ready for the show. Mm -hmm. If I had done the show then, I would never have gotten on again because I wasn't ready and he knew it. So right. um, he knew it, I did not know it. Right. I'll tell you what came about that first Tonight Show. Yes. When, um, I had done, I did it six more times with Johnny after that. But um, when, before Johnny left the show, he put together something called the ultimate Johnny Carson DVD collection. And one of the parts of it, it was broken into se segments. And one of the segments was his favorite first time spots 
that people did on a Tonight Show, and mine was one of them. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah, so that was a really one of the proudest moments for me that not only did I get on the show, but Johnny picked me as one of the people he liked right out of the show. How did your parents feel when you were getting on the Tonight Show for the first time? Well, you know, that, that legitimizes you. Mm -hmm. Back then, that was, uh, that was the USD a stamp of approval, you know? Oh, that, yeah. And uh, I was um, dating my wife at the time, who I'm married to now 30 years. And, um, her mother was not a big fan of her dating a comedian until I did The Tonight Show. <laughs> and she was getting her nails done one time. She lived in Texas in San Antonio. She says, do you know my daughter is dating this fellow that's going to be on The Tonight Show again tonight? Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden it was like you were like really legitimate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, you married a girl from Texas? Jewish girl from San Antonio, Texas. A Jewish girl from San Antonio. Yeah, San Antonio. I went there. Um, what are the odds of that? Yeah, they're, they're there. Uh, but um, I had a rabbi. I was looking to get married. I, 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 I was finished with... Uh, Okay, so now wait, let's talk about that. You're you're a boozer, you're a drug, you're you're a druggie, you're smoking pot, you're you're a thief. Uh, I'm assuming womanizing went along with all of that. Abyssal. Abyssal. Um, so so why why now are you changing your well, you're sober now. So I'm 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 figuring that had something to do I'm with four it. Four years right? sober when I met her. Okay, so wait, we got we gotta talk about that. Well, let's talk about all right, talk about your wife first, then we'll go back and talk about why you got sober. So so you're four years sober, you meet your wife, you're like, all right, I'm ready. This is- this well, I knew I was ready before I met her. And I had, I had uh, boundaries and uh, I had a rabbi that told me what to look for. <clears throat> what I needed for that? And a wife. What did he tell you? Uh, yeah. So- um, Hey, wait, what did the rabbi tell you to look for? So he said, she has to be Jewish. Okay. I mean, of course the rabbi's gonna tell you that. Uh, are you already um, observant at this point? I started going back. Uh, so, and I had a favorite rabbi, Rabbi Braverman, who was, he just moved from here. He was, he was, uh, he, he was a life-changing guy, changed my life, him and his wife. Told me I should find a Jewish girl, mm -hmm. wants to get married, okay, and that wants to have children, mm -hmm. and in that order, first of all, <laughs> first, and then get married. You know, he wants it, you know, chronologically. So, you, you know, you find the girl Jewish, she wants to get married to my dad. And she also um, needs to be a giving person. Um, and when I met her, she was working for the Jewish Found, uh, Federation. I did a show for them and she was on the board to raise money. So, she, so, so um, I knew she was a giving person and you have to be attracted to her physically. You have to, and I was. Mm -hmm. And um, there were many more, more things, I mean, so we sat down after the show, they sat me down at the table with her and we were having some coffee and stuff. And uh, she said, so how are you doing? I said, fine. And she said, um, we started talking about dating. I said, I'm looking to get married. And she looks at me and says, I think I can marry you. That's what she said. This is like 20 minutes into sitting with her. Wow. Yeah. And I said, uh, really? And she said, yeah, yeah, maybe. And uh, we exchanged phone numbers. Now, is she observant? No. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Reform. Reform. Okay. And um, the next morning, she picked me up at the hotel and drove me to the airport, and we, we talked. We exchanged phone numbers. Um, had some oh, you're not living in the same city. No, she's in San Antonio. So, um, oh, wow. Distance thing. And uh, finally, after about uh, two years, a year and a half, meeting up occasionally long distance and talking all the time. Uh, we decided she, she moved to LA, she moved to Fullerton. She got a job in Fullerton and uh, we decided to get married. Wow, um, 30 years so far, so good. She had just passed uh, 30 years. And she had all those qualities that the rabbi suggested you find. She had them all. And plus she had over a million frequent flyer miles. Which he did not mention, but she used to fly for business every week from uh, Texas up to um, <laughs> Detroit. 
and uh, she had over a million miles and that was very enticing too. I was looking at flying for free the rest of my life. So it was, uh, that's a good, that's a good uh, what is it called? A dowry. That's a good dowry right there, right? Yeah, they used to give you camels. So now they give you uh, a cow. You used to get a cow. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, so let's go back. So wh why get sober? Well, so, all right. You're lying. You're cheating. You're, you're stoned. You're losing the Tonight Show because you're saying fuck you. Yeah. What, what, what's, what's, you have a bottom, Mark? What was your bottom? Well, um, I moved to LA mm -hmm. and I still had some, uh, there's a word, a Yiddish word, seichel, which is some, 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 so, mm -hmm. much, but I was driving out here, driving, driving the car. Mm -hmm. I knew I, I would drink in, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't think twice about driving. And I knew that it's just a matter of time till I got popped. till I either got caught, killed somebody, killed myself, run over somebody, something serious was going to happen. So, um, because in New York, you don't drive. You know, right. you a bus, the subway, the taxi. Right. Right. You can get away with things a little longer. So I went to see a therapist here. And um, my first session with her, I admitted that I had a problem. And that admission changed my life. So you knew, see, I my therapist told me I had a problem. But you knew you had a problem? She asked me. She asked me a question. She said, do you ever, uh, I, she said, why are you here? Mm -hmm. I said, I think I drink too much. She goes, are you an alcoholic? I, 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 I just thought about it and I said, yes, I am. Okay, now wait, were there any alcohol? Now I come from Jewish family. I didn't think anybody was an alcoholic. Nobody was a drug addict. I've since learned that the schnapps my grandfather was drinking every morning. He was an alcoholic. I didn't know it then. Yeah, no, there was nothing that I know of my parents, nothing. nothing. And uh, um, I had an uncle that used to drink some, but not, not nothing. Uh, my grandparents, as far as I know, nothing. Okay. It was uh, my own creation. Okay. And um, so I came out here and she said, uh, you know, that's brave of you to admit that you're going to need some help. So I went and I got help and uh, I never, I never looked back. And it was, a, did, it, did sobriety come easily to you? I mean, did you make the decision and then you never, you never went out, you never backslid? Never, never took another sip, never did anything else. That's really amazing, Mark. That's very admirable. And well, it, it was um, uh, it was what I needed to do, and uh, I maybe never would have uh, stopped if I did it again. How how did um, how did how did it change your life back then? Well, immediately, the first thing it did was that I could I could drive without any fear anymore. That's an immediate gift. The first day. Mm -hmm. First day I'm driving around thinking, pull me over. All of a sudden I'm arrogant. You know, <laughs> you know so um, uh, clarity. I got, I started getting some, it took, took a couple of years. It didn't happen overnight. I went through a, long, you know, a couple of years of depression and misery and, you know, um, but I kept showing up. I just kept showing up. Okay, here's, nope. here's, my, here's my big question on this. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm, I, I don't want to forget it because I don't always remember to ask this. Do you, did you find that you got funnier, smarter, funnier? Yeah. You think? Yeah. I was afraid that I would not, but that, that seems to be a common fear amongst people. Like if mm -hmm. I, if I stop drinking, I'll never write again. I'll never. Right. So, um, I just kept doing it, kept performing. I was at a pretty good level of performing. I never drank before my shows, ever. Okay, let's talk about that. So, okay, you never drank before your shows. Uh, were you ever always, hungover or? Yeah, always, but always. not enough to really, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I would hang tight for the shows. You'd hang tight for the shows. And did you ever, other than with the Tonight Show, did you ever like make a fool out of yourself at the club? Or did you did you alienate any club owners? Were you ever an asshole with customers? I mean. Yeah, you know, I would, uh, not too much with customers. Um, I used to make um, phone, they used to have, I, they used to have these condos, these comedy condos. Right. And a lot of the comedians hated me because mm -hmm to make long distance calls and rack up like three, $400 phone bills and then leave the condo. Uh, and eventually the, the, you know, the club owner would rip the phone out. 
and they, and their comics would go, how come we don't have a phone? Because Mark Schiff was here last week. And uh, I have a reputation of like them ripping out phones all over the country because I would like start calling Europe and just, <laughs> that, just dialing China. I mean, those are the type of things I would just dial as many numbers as I could see how far I could extend the service. Um, so I would do stuff like that. And, um, but I, I didn't get into much trouble. Mine was a very solid, solitary life. Okay, well, how about with the other comics? I mean, it, were you like the likable drunk with everybody else? Yeah, well, I, I didn't do any, any drugs at all. I stopped that way back when with the pot. Okay. So I never tried anything really harsh. Uh-huh. Never tried a cocaine or crack or anything, nothing, zero. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my thing was wine and beer. And yeah, I was like a guy you go out with and, uh, you know, keep drinking with all night. Mm -hmm. That was it. Were you a blackout drunk? Yes. I could go away with you for two weeks to Hawaii, come back and ask you where I met you. Oh, wow. I'll tell you a story. This is unbelievable. I was in New York and uh, I was sitting somewhere and this girl sitting across from me and she starts waving at me like this. So I wave back and she comes over and starts talking. She goes, hey, Mark, how are you? I go, I'm good. And you? And she goes, you don't recognize me, do you? So I said, not really. <laughs> she goes, I'm Margaret. I lived with you for a year. Oh, stop. Listen to this. Listen. So I said, <laughs> I said, this is impossible. So I called my friend John at the loft that, you know, we, who I yeah, lived with. Me. Yeah. I said, was there a Margaret that lived with us? And he said, yeah, she lived there for about a year with us. No memory, no nothing. It's like she never existed. Never, like I never met her in my entire life. I saw her every day for a year. I can't even fathom that. Yeah, yeah. I still can't believe it. But that's, that's, that's the, I used this giant pink eraser you get her out of my head wow yeah wow. but I was, so, so the answer is yes i was blacking out and i was in health wise i was in bad shape high blood pressure high cholesterol fat so, so uh and i know you're like kind of a health person i'm a vegan that does push-ups a vegan that does push-ups so uh what made you go vegan and how long have you been a vegan well I've, I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. Wow. But that wasn't enough to get me healthy. You know, you can be a vegetarian, eat pizza and, 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 and drink Coke. That's vegetarian. So it's very unhealthy. Right. So, um, about five, six years ago, I decided to jump to the next level, which was uh, veganism. So I don't need any. What, 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 what did that to you? I was fat. I was still 50 pounds heavier and I wasn't losing weight. I was eating potato chips and all kinds of crap. And I, I just cleaned it up. And then um, I added to that meditation and exercise. Okay, I, so that's something you've just done in the last number of years. Yeah, I'm in the last five, six years and um, twice a day. And then exercise seven days a week. And what kind of exercise do you do? I have a treadmill and a Peloton bike. Uh -huh. and, and the big ball, you know, and uh, some weights. So... I'm on the Peloton or on the treadmill or I do some running outside or. And do you have a daily discipline with that, Mark? Like what, what, what does your day look like as far as your meditation, you're working out? So it takes me two hours to get ready in the morning. I, I could be the most beautiful woman in the world. If I, I mean, with the amount of time that I spend <laughs> ready. <clears throat> women are always going, I'm, I'm not ready yet. Well, neither <laughs> am I, okay? So I wake up. Yeah. And, um, I'll give it to you. I have the same routine. I wake up, yeah. go right into my meditation for 20 minutes. Do my TM while, while I'm still in bed. I sit up and do my meditation. Then I get out of bed and I walk the dog. Okay. okay? Then I come back in the house mm -hmm. and then I make breakfast for my wife. I've been every day, seven days a week for the last 30 years. Oh my God, I love this. What do you, what do you make for breakfast? Um, well, usually fruit, fresh fruit and coffee. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, other stuff that she wanted, but she doesn't want the omelets more anymore. But I, I, I make her breakfast. And is stuff. she vegan with you? No, no. She doesn't eat red meat, but she eats fish and chicken and turkey. Okay. So I make that for her. 
And I set that aside. She's got a nice little thing going there. And then I get on and I do my exercise. How much time do you do on the Peloton or on the treadmill? 45, 50 minutes a day total. Then I get off. Then I um, um, shower. Mm -hmm. My prayers every day. Mm -hmm. I, uh, do my, my prayers. Some secular, some Jewish. Mm -hmm. And um, I have breakfast and I start my day. So what time is that usually? I get up around 6.30 and I start rolling around 9. Wow. Okay, so you're not wasting your day at all. I'm exhausted by the time it's 9 o'clock. I've done so many things already. <laughs> I'm exhausted listening to you. So, all right. So, so let's, I, I don't know if you know about, if you know this, but I lead this group of people called the COVID crazies of which Tova Abadi is one. And she said, ask Mark, if he remembers that we were married in our twenties. What? You were married to Tova? No, no. Tova, you're making that up. Um, okay. So, so we're the COVID crazies. How has, how has this whole thing, how is your life different than it was a year ago? What do you do? What, 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 what observance are you of this COVIDness? So um, I made a decision not to waste my um, time, you know, yeah. with, with being locked in. I knew I was going to be locked in for a while. Yeah. Once, I once heard a guy say, um, it was interesting. I, I heard this guy say, you know, he goes, yeah, I, I wanted to write, I've been writing, wanting to write a book my whole life. And I, I never found the time. And I always said, if I ever went to prison, I would write a book because there I have the time. And then he said, you know what? I went, I ended up going to prison for three years and I still didn't write the book. Still didn't find the time. So I never wanted to be one of these guys. Said, so writing has never really been an issue. So I decided to write a book during the COVID period. And it's now uh, at, at my agent in New York. It's, Fantastic. Uh, it's ready to go out. Or uh, to be shopped around to uh, publishers. Nonfiction, fiction. What is it? Well, I've been writing for the Jewish Journal for um, essays for the last um, two years. Mm -hmm. Collection. When COVID started, I had about ten essays that I had written for the Jewish Journal, mm -hmm. and then I thought, you know what? I'm going to write. I'm going to make a book of my essays, and I wrote another fifty. Wow. And they're all online. If you go to Jewish Journal Markshift.com, if you go to Mark Schiff Jewish Journal articles, Mark Schiff Jewish Journal articles, 50 of my articles will pop up. Wait, now, how often were they publishing your were they doing you must have been like bi-weekly or something? Yeah. You know, I would say like once a, every week and a half, two weeks, something like that, sometimes mm -hmm. more, sometimes a little less. But um, I decided I'm not going to just sit around and wait for something that's never going to happen. So I uh so you've been writing most of those during COVID? Almost all of them. Wow. And so give us some topics that you've written about during this time. Well, I had a dog that I, uh, I, I wrote a couple of my dog. I had a dog that um, I wrote one on my Yorkie that died and about me walking the dog to, I had a dog years ago. One of the stories was about, I had a dog years ago that I, I, was, I, was, too, I was afraid to go in when they put the dog down. And I promised if I ever got another dog and I had it and they were going to put it down, I would go in there and be with it at the last moment. And, you know, and the story was about me spending those last moments with that dog. Uh, that was one story. A mm -hmm. lot of family stories, a lot about my parents growing up, mm -hmm. school, not going to school, mm -hmm. a lot of Jewish stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so, and a lot of stuff about my friends in comedy. A lot of comedy you, stuff. Do you talk about it, but not about COVID, not about? A little bit. There's a um, bunch of articles, but I, some of the articles have COVID stuff, but I don't, I don't want the book to be dated. Right, like, right. It's going to end. Right. It, it will? Won't... Really? You promise? I mean, yeah, it's just everything eventually, you know. Yeah. You know. And so one day it'll end and then, you know, you got a book on, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, who wants to read a book on COVID? Yeah. And it's, no, that's very wise. So, and have you been able to uh, have you been able to do any of this online comment? Like, are you doing? Are, are, are I'm you doing a Zoom show on Monday night. We're doing one for Eula Girls School, a, a Jewish uh, girls school. My mm -hmm. she works at the school. I've, I did one in Israel from here, Israel, about three weeks ago. I did a live show with a guy named Elon Gold. 
comedian uh -huh. yeah we did a uh, live show in the outdoor thing in uh, uh oh you mean like you were there yeah we went out and it was a restaurant and we did it live wow how was that for the first time in first night was rough for me it was like i just starting out i mean i hadn't been on stage in months and then the second night was better and the third was even better than that but uh it's going to take a while to get my chops back so wait was the audience virtual yeah. or were they there they were there they were and were there. they socially distanced and all that yeah. stuff yeah uh -huh. six seven feet apart you know the tables were sitting the people were sitting together people that came together but otherwise right. they were sitting apart and um so that's what we did and um, I keep do writing have, stuff. Do you have, and, and I imagine it's gonna take everybody time to get their chops back because it is different when you're just not getting in front of an audience, the time, everything has to- Right, but I'm still writing a joke, so one day it'll come together. Well, I wrote one this morning, what was it? Um, I said, you know, when people die, they usually do a, a moment of silence for them. I said, when my mother died, we did a minute of screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wanted her to, you know, we wanted to feel it, feel honored. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know we were really thinking about her. <laughs> <laughs> so God, I'm, I'm wrecking the place. So, so Mark, let's go back to how did how did you go from being that little yeshiva kid who, who was coming home to a reformed house? How did you make the decision and when to become observant? Well, I always kept my finger in the pie. I always kept reading like little Jewish books and. Uh, I would see these religious Jews walking around and I really felt like, you know, one of my, I, I belong over there. I always felt like I was missing out on something. I always felt like uh, that's, those are my people more than, it's not, it's not that I, I have anything against anybody. I just mm -hmm. felt like that was a group that I really wanted to belong to. And how did you navigate that with comedy? Because so much of comedy is Friday, Friday night. It's almost, it's almost impossible. It's, so it's, what? Are, how the hell did? How long have you been doing it? Doing well. Being, being orthodox. So, I started back around eighty four, eighty five, and it's it's you know it's still very problematic at times. You know, I mean, like I turned down a lot of uh, almost everything. You know, because you can't do a weekend. I mean, because all those well, party gigs and all of that—that's a weekend. Yeah. Well, sometimes you know. If we're in Vegas, you just go down and you do it. There's, there's, you know, we kind of skirt around it a little at times, but uh, right. let's put it, I do the best I can. Oh, so in other words, if you're, if you're, or if you have, have arrived in the town where you're going to perform, you can get up there. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. I got gotcha. you. And, and I, it probably would not be sanctioned by, but uh, I just don't ask. Right. And so you've been open you've been touring with Jerry Seinfeld for 15 years how the hell so you can't get on a plane right on Friday so we, yeah we've, we've been touring and uh luckily a lot of the Jerry's work goes out on you know he goes out during the week now because he's that big an act right we do Wednesdays and Thursdays and sometimes you just do one city you know there's not but um well what about like 15 years ago just keep I did it I did it. You did it. Yeah. And and so, all right, so let's talk about some. So you and Jerry have go back to the 70s. So how did you become, I mean, I know Mario and uh, I know Mario has opened for Jerry on and off. I, I've known Mario since the 80s. How did you become the guy that Jerry handpicked to be the guy? Well, there's a couple of us that do it. Mm -hmm. Mario is one of the guys. I'm, I'm one of the guys. Um, so because we're friends is not why I do it. I'm sure. Yeah, Jerry does not. Uh, he's, got a, sure. he's got a brand. Mm -hmm. And in front of two, three thousand people, he needs to be able to count on you. Absolutely. So he loves my work. And he likes spending time with me. Uh, we have a good time together. It's really almost like a, it's 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 like a, a fun weekend mm -hmm. work, but it's really a fun weekend. So um, can you give us a, a Jerry Road story? Come on, you got to have at least one Jerry story. Well, there was one night I'll tell you. It was funny. We were in um, I can't somewhere in the middle of the country. I, I, uh -huh. 
a small town. I can't remember what it was. Uh, somewhere in Iowa, in fact, somewhere in Iowa. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with him in the afternoon. We, we take a, we always take a walk together and uh, he's hungry. So we go into this little deli and he orders a tuna sandwich. And, uh, he, and the, he says to me, you want something? I said, no, no. I said, uh, it doesn't look good, this stuff. I don't like it. <laughs> he says, uh, it's fine. So he eats it. So I go to his room to get him with the, the producer. We, go, we always meet him in his room. And he's at the table, drenched, soaking wet, like vomiting, like sick to his stomach. And he can't even talk. And I said, what's my uh, food poisoning? And meanwhile, the show's going to start in 20 minutes. And there's 2,500 people. Oh, my God. So, um, maybe 3,000. So guys, the producer goes, uh, Kevin goes, you want me to cancel? He goes, no. But, uh, just let's go over there. Uh, I'll try to do it. And he, he, he collapses as we uh, were holding on to him. He collapses. Oh, my God. We get him up. And we get in the car. And we, we go over there. And this is what he says to me. He goes, just go out there and stay out there until I'm ready. <laughs> I said, well, you have any idea how long that might be? <laughs> I, I don't feel good. <laughs> so I don't know if it's going to be 20 minutes or an hour and a half. But I noticed 3,000 people. And oh. now I got to pace myself. And you have to leave your closer and you have to do all the stuff. I got to rearrange everything because I don't know what the hell is going on. So uh, anyway, I did about 40 minutes and then I look and I see he's ready. And he goes out and it was one of the best shows I had ever seen him do. He was, yeah. he pulled himself together. He's a consummate pro. And I'll tell you one other story. One wow. Other, one, one more story? Yeah. So um, we're in Indianapolis and we're walking around in the afternoon again with Kevin. He's mm -hmm. the and Jerry likes cars. And we yeah. see this uh, thing that says uh, uh, 60s cars, 50s and 60s uh, cars. And we go in and they got the most beautiful uh, Camaros and Mustangs and GTOs and these beautiful, in beautiful condition. And Jerry looks at me and goes, um, you like these? I said, yeah. He goes, pick one out. You can have anything you want. I'll buy it for you. So I said, really? He goes, yeah, just whatever you want. Just tell me, tell me what you want and we'll, we'll get it for you. And I said, so I started looking around, but I couldn't pull the trigger on it. I, I didn't have the guts to like go, I'm going to get this. I'm, I, I, this gift just seemed, overwhelmed me. So I said to him, it's all right. And, and we walked out and I felt terrible that I didn't, you know. So I called, yeah, yeah. I called a friend of mine and I told him, and he said to me, you know, when somebody makes you an offer to give you something, they want to do something for you. Mm -hmm. it, it means something to them. You're, you're not giving them the opportunity to give to you something they want to give to you. You're taking, actually taking from them. He said, if he ever offers you a car again, take it. I said, okay, but he's not, who's going to offer me a car again? <laughs> you know, nobody has new cars, right? Yeah. So, we're riding on the 405 going to an airport and we're riding in this uh, beautiful Mercedes 300D turbo diesel. It's a, it's a classic car. I love the car. And he looks at me, he goes, uh, I'm thinking of selling this. Do you want to buy it? So I'll give you a good deal. I said, you know, the truth is I don't have the money. I can't afford to buy it. He goes, uh, I'll tell you, I'll give it to you if you want it. So I said, really? Now I remember what, what my friend said to me. He goes, you want it? I go, yeah, sure. And he says to me, he goes, the only problem is that the radio is not working great. Do you want me to fix the radio and then give it to you? Or you want to take it like this? So I said, you might as well fix the radio if you're going to give it to me. And uh, I have it in my garage now, seven years later, this beautiful Mercedes. Wow. Wow. That's, a, great story? That's a great story. All right. So let's hear, let's hear a couple of road stories. So Okay, so back, okay, so wait, we never heard the end of the Carson story. So you do you do Johnny for the first time. Obviously, yeah, and, and obviously then I, he loved I your set. Yeah. And, and then, did you get a panel? Second time. Second time. So what is that like when Johnny calls you over to the desk? Well, you don't know he's gonna call you over. Like, right. Oh, you know, you're standing in the back, McCall, he goes, just stand there, look at him. And if he goes like this, you go over and 
um, I stood there and he goes, and um, it was like somebody got a firecracker in my butt because <laughs> I just shot over there. I just, Dee! just like, and I jumped up on that little step, that one little thing to get up there and I shook his hand. And uh, what was amazing about it was um, n not only being there, of course, and dream come true, because that was amazing. His focus that after like 25, 30 years of doing this, mm -hmm. you watched every second of the performer while you were on. Because during the break, he started going over my routine with me. And he go, you know, I think if you add this or do this or fix this. Stop. And he was giving me insights into the routines. Um, he was also incredibly, um, what's the word? Um, gentle in this, when he would ask his questions. Like for instance, like now, if you go on a panel, you know, these guys are kind of tough and, and it, there's a lot of crudeness and cruelty sometimes, but they'll ask questions like you sit down, they'll go, so how's your sex life? You know, or, you know, how's, how's it going with the old lady? You know, whatever. So Johnny knew I had some marriage jokes that he wanted, I might want to do. So he, this is the way he set it up. He goes, you know, Mark, I don't know you very well, you know, but um, I know you're newly married and I don't mean to pry, but how's it going? He asked in a very gentle way, and led you into your material. Led me into it. It wasn't, uh, yeah, it was nice. It was nice. And of course, nobody listened better and uh, mm -hmm. understood when to talk and when to not talk than him. Mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was amazing. And then who was, who was the guest on the panel when you did panel the first time? Um, Bob Einstein. Oh. Yeah, was, was there. And then I was also there with, um, who, who married, what was her name that married Billy Joel, the beautiful model? Christy yeah. Brinkley. Christy Brinkley, right, right. So, so I'm on the panel and Christy Brinkley is sitting next to me, um, sitting next to Johnny, and then they stop for a commercial. So I lean over to Christy Brinkley and I say hello. And she had just brought out this beautiful uh, 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 table book, coffee table book of photos from Africa of wild animals. Uh -huh. It's gorgeous. So I lean over it and I go, you know, these photos you took are unbelievable. These are some of the greatest photos I've ever seen in my life. She goes, I just pushed the button. They set up everything. <laughs> yeah. Somebody just said how many times we were on Carson. I think you said before six times. Six, six, uh, total of 10 or 11. I can't remember exactly. 10 or 11. Wow. And then with Leno. Oh, oh, God. All right. Well, I want to talk about Leno. I also want to talk about Dave, about Letterman a little bit. You, you know, Gabe was uh, Dave's monologue writer for a, a period of time. So now talk about doing Dave. When, when, how did, at what point in your career did you get Letterman? Well, um, I got it. I was still in New York. Oh, so that, you did it a long time ago. Yeah. I started there doing it and I was still in New York and I was still um, drinking my wine and beer. Okay. So, um, so you did Letterman before you did Carson, obviously. Yes. And um, my first Letterman, I had a routine where I belched um, <laughs> during the routine. I could belch on, on command. <clears throat> See, it's a nice. <laughs> You learn that as a kid in New York, you know, you just learn to do certain things. I was always very good at it. So in the routine, uh, I belch. And then I sit down with Letterman on the panel and he goes, oh my God, you belched. And then I belched again and he didn't like it. So he, he banned me from the show. Oh. I wrote him a lovely letter, really lovely letter. And I said, listen, I, I, you know, I apologize. That'll never happen again. And he was very kind. He read the letter and he had me on again. I mean, you know, I made the amends to him. I said, I was sorry. Um, that was my comedy routine. What do you want me to do? You know? Did you do it again? Did you do Letterman again sober? No. No. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And then- uh, Do you think that might've been why, Mark? Do you think that the fact that, because Dave's very in tune with all that stuff. I don't know. You, mm -hmm. uh, things were changing and it just, you know, whatever. Yeah. It wasn't my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. How I, about Leno? Who? Leno. Leno, I did a bunch of times, and it was always fun to do with him. He was he was terrific to me. Couldn't be any. Did you come up with with Jay? Jay was a generation ahead. Uh huh. He was already on the road working, so I didn't really know him from New York. Mm -hmm. um, he was already out there, and then he lived in California, so um, we didn't really work the same places. But then I got to know him, of course. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, I used to do a comedy and magic club with him all the time. Which he still was doing before COVID. Yeah, so he's been doing it for like 25 years every Sunday night whenever he's in town. Keeps him sharp. It's so interesting because I, when Jay used to do Dave, that was like one of my favorite sets to watch. Jay was so dark and so brilliant and he changed so much when he got The Tonight Show. I, I prefer the dark uh, Jay. Well, he was, he was really one of the uh, consummate stand-ups there. But to see him live now, he's, he hasn't lost a lot. I mean, he's still great. I would go, I still go and watch him at the Comedy Nights Club. I'll sit there and watch him for an hour. That's he's, so fabulous. He's, he's terrific. So let's talk about your writing career a little bit because you have a book. And as a matter of fact, Jeff, Jeff um, Abraham is on here and he said that he was, he did PR for I Killed. Yeah. Hello, Jeff. Jeff has a, a wonderful book out now, I think. Does he? Yes. Well, he's, Somebody else's, right? He didn't write it, did he? Uh, oh, somebody just asked, who do you consider the best stand-up performer today aside from you? Gee, I think I know the answer to that. Do you? I, I would say you were gonna say Seinfeld, but no. Well, I, I can't, I, there's no, I, I can't say anybody's the best. True, yes. There, there's a level. I mean, is Stravinsky better than Brahms, better than Baker? Right. The level that people hit that they're so friggin' good. So tell us some of the people that you, some of the people that you love. Well, Jerry, of course, mm -hmm. Bill, Bill Burr mm -hmm. is, is, is great. Brian Regan is, 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 oh, Brian. you know, um, Larry, Larry, Larry Miller did my living room a couple of times. Larry is one of the funniest people on the planet. Larry started my play, the comic, and he was absolutely, if, if we made it, we made it to Broadway with it. He would have won an award. He was so great. He's fantastic. He's such a talented guy. What a nice guy. So, mm -hmm. but on any given night, you know, it depends how you're feeling, you know, um, when you see a comic. Mm -hmm. I mean, That's it really is. And it's so subjective. But <clears throat> Jerry is, I mean, I'll sit and watch him every night and I, I learn from him and I just laugh my head off. Incredible. So tell us about I Killed. What kind of stories are in there? So Rich Scheidner mm -hmm. um, and I, Rich worked for, um, he did um, Jeff Fox where he had that TV show. Um, the, the the redneck thing. Yeah, yeah, the TV show. What was it called? I can't believe I can't remember it now. Um, it was Sketches, it was a sketch show. Mm -hmm. It was a Jeff Foxworthy show. No, this, oh. was, no, be, this was before. This was before, okay. So he had a show and it was sketches and a lot of the redneck guys and Rich wrote on the show and uh -huh. then I came in and I uh, wrote some sketches and stuff. So we would sit during lunch. One time we were sitting during lunch and we were all telling road stories, like six, seven comics. And we were laughing so hard and people from other offices were coming in, listening to these stories and laughing and their head off. Mm -hmm. So that night, Rich calls me up on the phone. He goes, uh, listen, you know, man, some of these stories are great. Somebody's got to really get them down. You want to write a book with me? And I said, yeah, and the next day we set up shop. Wow. Uh, we wrote, I Kill True Stories of the Road of America's uh, Comics. And it, it's a book with 200 road stories. Do you have a favorite or a couple, do you have, can you pull one out that one of your favorites? Um, there was one with um, um, Tim, um, oh God, what am I going to do here? Tim, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Tim, uh, you know. Allen. Tim Allen, yeah. Thank you. I'll tell you a very short one. He had one who was on stage one night and somebody was heckling him. And, and he puts the guy away and the guy keeps heckling and he puts him away, keeps heckling him. 
And finally, Tim says, you know, if you don't stop, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come up stage and punch you in the face. And the guy heckles him again. Tim comes up, punches him in the face, and knocks out two teeth. What? And after the show, Tim finds out that it was the guy next to him that was doing the heckling. Tim had punched the wrong guy. Oh my God, how high was Tim when he was doing that? Holy Who shit. knows? I, uh, then uh, Leno, Leno wrote an incredibly funny thing. Before he was married, he wrote, he wrote this, uh, he gave us a story. He met this girl one night at the club and he goes back to her apartment in New York. And she's up on like the 25th, 28th floor of some high rise building. And uh, they're up at the apartment and uh, they're about to make love. And she says, tie me to the bed. And uh, he says, hey, yeah, I never. And she goes, "Come on!" And he ties her to the bed. He ties her feet in her hands, and then he goes. Uh, he realizes that it's getting late, and he and it's, he's parked on alternate side of the street parking. He has to move his car. So he says, "Listen, let me untie. You. I'll be right back because I got to move my car." She goes, "No, just leave me. Just come back in a few minutes, and then just leave me. I'll be all right." So he says, "Fine." So he leaves, and he goes downstairs, and then he realizes he doesn't know her last name, and he doesn't remember what floor she was on. Because he just went up with her that night in the elevator and she pressed the button. He has no idea what floor or, uh, you know, so, so, so now he's out of the building and the building's locked. So he's waiting in the bushes for somebody to open the door so he could sneak in the building like a burglar. So somebody comes out and he sneaks in and he starts at like the 20th floor and he's walking around going, uh, Judy, Judy. <laughs> And he's, he's whispering her name in the middle of the night, hoping that she hears it. And she'll go, I'm in here. Hide me, I'm in here. Anyway, he never finds her. And he, but he, he, he knew she had a roommate that was gonna come home, so he just left her. And sure enough, the roommate, uh, anyway, what happened was, she, he's doing a club, he doesn't see her again, but the roommate goes to the club where he is, and says, I, I'm just, I came to see you. She says, you're really funny. I was just gonna tell you, she thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened to her. What? Yeah, she just thought that, you know, she so got off on this thing of being tied up and left there that uh, nobody's ever topped that. <laughs> excellent, so excellent. Okay, that's, that's, a, that, that's a good one to leave. And so, so Mark, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, still in the middle, well, kind of, Oh, uh, will you will you get the vaccine? Are, are you ready to like bring it on? Give it to me. Well, you know, I, last week I took the written COVID test. <laughs> so so far so good. I I, I passed. Did you ace it? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll probably take it. Yeah. I mean, you know what's, you know, what am I going to do? Sit home. No. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's your alternative. Do you go to supermarkets? Do you, what do you do? What's I go your all over. I go all over. You go all over. I go to supermarkets. Um, I go to the doctors. I went to the dentist five times already. Wow. Five times. Yeah. I had some work that needed to be done. That's a little frightening when you're you know, having people stick their fingers in your mouth during COVID. You yeah. Know? Uh, that's a little uh, bizarre. Does your dentist do COVID preparedness in the office there? Yeah. And they make you gargle with hydrogen peroxide and spit it out and yeah, you know, do the best they can. But I go to, I go to all the stores and uh, return things and um, go You're not afraid. Um, I'm not happy about it, but I'm not gonna, uh, not gonna lock myself up for the rest of my life, you know, or, or whatever. Oh, that was so bad that I didn't take that phone off the hook. Hang on a second. I cannot believe I didn't do that. All right, we'll have to take care of that. So, so, I'm careful when I go, you know, I'll wear, you know, the mask and, and lather up and, uh, you know, sometimes wear my gloves and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm careful when I go to these places. I go to the hotels, I've rented hotels with, with the wife, you know, we went down to um, Palm Springs two weeks ago, we've gone out to the you beach. Oh, so you flew? No, no, drove to Palm Springs. Okay. Oh, Palm Springs. I'm thinking, okay. No, we haven't. All right, so you, you, you haven't flown? No. Um, but you'll go to hotels. Okay. All right. And then uh, I'll eat in outdoor restaurants when they're open a little bit. 
I'll get some food from restaurants. I, I, I cook my own food because I'm a vegan. So right. be careful how, you know. You're still wiping things down when you bring them home from the store? Not as much. That's, yeah. I, I used to do all the boxes outside and now I do them in the room. And I, but not as much. I've, I've eased up on that. Has anybody close to you gotten sick? Um, yeah, I've known a couple, a couple of people and they've all come through it. Good. One struggled, he was older and he struggled a lot, but he came through it. I don't know anybody that's succumbed to it yet. So, excellent. So Mark, last question. We're moving towards the end of this, let's hope. Do you, do you feel changed by this? Do you think it's gonna impact, like, can you imagine the next time you're gonna be standing in a club with people sitting close? Like, when, like that's not gonna be anytime soon. That no, you, that's not gonna happen for me for a while. I got offered Vegas recently. They opened up a club there, uh, yeah. but I, I had to turn them down. Um, because of my age, you know, being in 60s, mm -hmm. um, my audience will not be the first people to come out. They'll be the last. Right. So uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, if I was 25 years old, mm -hmm. I'm sure, I could, you know, and I was popular, I could get uh, 150 people in tonight to see me, you know, they're, they're not afraid, nor should they be really. I don't so what, what, what do you see your next year or two looking like? Like, what, what how do you think you're going to spend it? I'm going to do as many COVID shows as I can, like, you know, either if there's some outdoor or whatever I can do live here mm -hmm. and some Zoom, a few that I can, and I'll just keep writing. Mm -hmm. There's something inside me that, that needs to be written. And this is an opportunity. It's, it's wonderful that you're, that you're seizing it. And, and, uh, and I think a lot of it is that you get up first thing and get on that peloton every day. I think that every probably- Every day, helps. seven days a week I exercise. It's fantastic. So I'll, uh, I'll walk. Fantastic. Well, Mark, thank you so much for doing this. It's been so lovely getting to know you. Um, you and too. Thank you. And, and I look forward to a lot more you. And I'm, uh, so what can people buy? What, where should I send them? What, 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 what should they get of yours? I don't have a lot, you know? I Kill, is that, is that yeah. on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's, it's, it's considered, a lot of people consider it's, it's the best road book of comedians ever written. It got, it got the uh, New York Times editor's pick of the week and it got tremendous reviews. Um, it's a great book. It's a fun, fun book to read, a lot of laughs and you'll learn a lot about the road that you didn't know. So it's called I Kill True Stories of the Road. Um, and uh, you know, I do, uh, I, I, I do my Facebook a little but nothing serious. Yeah, and you're on, you're on Instagram, you're on- a little bit. Yeah. I don't have a big following, but I, I, I didn't try to. Well, you're busy doing other things. I am. I, I, I just don't want to spend my time doing those things. I, I'd rather create stuff. Love that. Love that. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. And I hope I see you, uh, well, maybe in some virtual room. Well, I know your husband for a thousand years. Boy, I got stories about him. Ooh. <laughs> Give Ooh. me one. Do you got a Gabe story? No, I don't. I really don't. Yeah. He's a sweet guy. Yeah, my husband actually, but yeah. Okay. yeah, but we have two fantastic children. Do you have children? Three boys. How old are your kids? Jacob, Eli, and Noah. How old? Uh, 29, 28, and 25. And are, you, are they in LA? Two in LA, one in New York. One's been, the oldest is married, just became a grandfather for the first time. Oh, mazel tov. Yeah, so uh, he's married, living here. My other son is living here. They're, they're both in show business. One's an agent at CAA. Wow. There is um, um, a producer for uh, reality TV. And yeah. the other is in banking in New York, the young guy. Wow. Yeah. Departure. I know my son's a great agent because when I call him, he doesn't return my call. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fabulous. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been my pleasure. Lovely. This was really a blast for me. Thank Thanks you for having so me. Have a good evening. Take Be care, well. everybody. Bye. Bye. See you next week, guys.